this was close. Um, okay, now we're recording. I, I, we will be posting these at some point in the future. We're not sure when or where. Probably a, a national you know, a coffee site. Another request that we have is that our committee is becoming smaller and we really need new people participating. And one of the critical parts is that Cindy Pasco and myself are not gonna be doing this forever. We can see the end uh, coming in sight. So we won't be here too many more years. So we really need more people to participate. Lastly, as we're going along, if you have questions, you have a chat button on the bottom of your screen and go ahead and put your questions there. And when Mike is done at the end of the presentation, we'll have time for questions. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Mike for, uh, Thompson and see what he can do. All right, thank you, Louie. Um, so you folks can see my screen with the, the opening slide, I take it. Thumbs up if everybody can see that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm good. Uh, sorry that I can't be there in person, but thank you for having me here. Um, what I'm going to try to do is compress about two days worth of information in 20 minutes and, uh, and then leave plenty of time to, uh, for questions. Um, what we wanted to do is an update on third party forest certification. And then uh, Ray and I talked a little bit about making it particularly relevant to the forest engineering side of things a little bit. Yep. Um, but part of this will be just an overall update on forest certification, particularly SFI and FSC. Um, and then to talk a little bit about uh, a workshop that we held last year, which hopefully some of you went to. Uh, let's see now. Why isn't this advancing? Come on. There we go. Um, so just a photo of me, just see so if you ever see me in the woods, uh, this is what Mike I look like, or, or if you remember, what? Your slide didn't advance on our screens. Uh, it's advanced on mine. May, might take a minute. No, it should be instantaneous. You may be sharing the wrong screen with us. What are you seeing? Uh, now we see you in your outline on the left and we see 25. So now we're seeing I think <clears throat> what we should be seeing. Okay, what I've been finding on some of these calls is that there's a lag. Um, so I'll, I'll try to leave plenty of time there. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is, um, believe it or not, it's a little more than this now, but we've been doing third party forest certification for 25 years or more. And it's a good time to ask, well, what have we learned during that time? What has Maine learned? What have we learned in the region? What have we learned nationally and, and certainly internationally? I wanna give you a, a very brief update on the certification standards update process for SFI and FSC. We're in the middle of an update cycle for both those programs. And just talk a little bit about what to look for. Uh, but between when I was supposed to give this talk and today, as we all know, we have this COVID-19 pandemic and it is rapidly changing how audits are conducted. And it's very much a work in progress. Maybe some of you who are auditors or subject to audits uh, are experiencing this, but we'll talk about that and how some of these changes may um, actually linger into the future. And then I'll talk a little bit about where I think third party certification is headed, particularly as it relates to um, forest engineering. So hopefully the slide is advancing um, mm -hmm. for you. As I mentioned, it's been 25 years um, that, that we've been involved with certification. Uh, I've been involved that entire time as a member of the Forest Stewardship Council's yeah. working right. group that established the yeah. first regional standards. Right. And uh, I've been an auditor that entire time. I also work with landowners who are certified and need ecological inventories done or old growth surveys. So I, I've played a, a lot of different roles. I've also recently wrapped up a contract with the Forest Stewardship Council, helping them revise their standards. And I'll talk about that a little later on. But all this led us, and the other thing is that um, we held last spring, I think it was the first 
introduction of forest certification course at the University of Maine in the School of Forest Resources, and I think some of you on here maybe took that class, um, recognizing that we're really, there, there aren't many places to go to learn about certification. And so the class uh, was as a broad sweep introduction to the history of certification, the different certification programs, and um, how audits done, how to prepare for an audit if you're the landowner or chain of custody person. And so in doing that, we brought in a lot of guest speakers and we all sort of marveled that, boy, it's been a long time. And then when we realized it was 25 years and counting, we, number one, we all felt pretty old, but we also felt it's a good time to look back. And so this, what you're seeing on the screen is um, the flyer that the main chapter of SAF put together for that conference last October. And again, probably some of you were there at that meeting. And I'm assuming that this PowerPoint will be available if you, if you want to read some of these things. I'm not going to read all of this, uh, but this is the agenda. It was two days. The first day really focused on a bit of the history of certification and um, the land side of things, the forest being certified. And then the second day was about more the so socioeconomic side of things, the the social responsibility side, the sustainability policy side, but then also the marketing of certified forest products. Um, and when you, if you didn't attend this, when you see the, um, the topics and the speakers, you'll see it really was a bit of a who's who of people that have been involved with certification from day one, like John McNulty at Seven Islands, uh, all the way up until the present day. Um, I do know that the, I believe the video and audio from this conference is available. So if you look at this agenda, when you, when you get access to the, um, to the PowerPoint, you can go and, and just let me know. And Louie knows how to get a hold of me. Ray knows how to get a hold of me. But if you want to look at a particular talk, you can call that up and take a look at it. So this is, again, this is the two, year, you know, two days that I'm going to summarize really quickly. It's obviously a, a bit of my opinion on it. But what, what have we learned? But, so we brought together people that have been involved with certification since the beginning. We brought together auditors, landowners, um, people that are chain of custody certified, and then representatives of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, you know, the main uh, implementation committee, as well as at the national level. The same for the Forest Stewardship Council. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of time for reflecting on the past and some good talks. Um, and so I was glad that conference was held and, and it was very well attended. We were easily able to get by video opening remarks by Angus King and Susan Collins, um, which to me reflects there's still strong political support, particularly in Maine, for third party certification. And Maine is still recognized as a leader in forest certification. When I go across the country and meet with landowners, um, the first thing they ask is what's happening in Maine? Because they, they still across the country recognize that Maine has always been and remains at the, the cutting edge of certification. Um, and Angus King, you may remember, <clears throat> was the governor when the Maine BPL first got their land certified, and I, and I was an auditor on that, and uh, he was a strong supporter of SFI and FSC, and, and that was really the beginning of dual certification audits, um, where you can do FSC and SFI at the same time, and, and um, Senator King has just, he's remained interested and involved with certification issues, if, if not actively working on them in his job, but he's He's aware of what's going on, and, and Susan Collins is the same. She, you know, they're knowledgeable about certification and what it's meant to Maine. At a high level, we learn from some of the speakers that certification remains part of many corporate uh, commitments to sustainability. There, there was a lot of question of like, wh why do people get certified? Why do they stay certified? And what we heard from some people, you know, John McNulty is always good at making the point that um, you know we're always a week or two away from just um, saying certification is no longer worthwhile. We're not getting a green premium. It's expensive to get audited. And yet they remain certified. Um, I think that certification adds value. It adds access to market in some cases. But what we heard from the large corporations at the talk was that they're committed to sustainability at a broad level. And that's starting to involve carbon and life cycle for products, that kind of thing. And Having the, the forest products that they use certified uh, is just a 
core part of that sustainability program. And in a lot of ways, forest certification led to third party certification of other elements of their, of their supply chain or their, just their operations. So even though the numbers, the acres of certification are still relatively high, they have leveled off, but I think these companies are going to remain committed to certification over time because it fits with their, their sustainability mission. Uh, and as I mentioned, very few landowners are seeing green premiums that you get paid more. In some cases, you might here and there, um, but mostly it's to gain access to customers that like if it's a Home Depot or a paper mill that said, look, if you, if you want to sell to me, you have to have a certified product. And so it's market access versus a green premium. One of the things we recognized a lot of, some of us, the old guard from the, the early days is that auditing has changed. Um, it used to be um, definitely an expert system where you'd have um, often academics like, like Bob Seymour was one of the early auditors um, coming out and really talking a lot about silviculture. Why did you cut that tree? Why not that tree? Why did you, why didn't you leave that cavity tree and really striving towards improved forest management. But auditing has become more formalized. It's under an ISO program now. Uh, and auditors really are discouraged and even prohibited from asking too many questions. You just ask for the information. So some, we look back on some of the early arguments that we had in the field, but there were spirited, well-meaning arguments um, over silviculture. And the landowners benefited from that, from having experts come out and challenge them on their management. And um, regrettably, some of that isn't there and, and people miss that in some ways. So it has become a little more formalized, a little more streamlined, um, in some ways a little more affordable. Um, so that was just a change, a change in the times. And part of that is just people, like I'm 60 and I'm still, still at it. But there's a changing of the guard. A lot of the people that were the early land managers that, that brought certification to the, their companies that are retiring. Um, John McNulty is retired. Um, John Cashman at Seven Islands who worked with him is retired. Blake Brunston at um, Irving. I'm not sure if he's technically retired. Perhaps he is. But they, those were, on the landowner side of things, the early... Um, the early technical people are engaged in the process and they're retiring and moving on. And you have a, a younger uh, cohort of people coming in and probably in many ways that's for the good, but in some ways uh, during this 25 year retrospective, there was this feeling that maybe we, we lost um, a little bit of what was good about certification in the beginning. And so the end result was enthusiasm for continuing this discussion of um, where we've been with certification and where are we going? The, the hard part of that though is that there isn't really a forum for doing that. Um, and so it, it's up to us to do things like the conference we had last year. So briefly, the certification standards update, um, Sustainable Forestry Initiative, SFI, everybody what you're gonna hear about the standards and auditing, they're, they're adapting to this COVID-19, but they're, what they did is, um, so auditing practices, which I'll talk about a little later, are evolving rapidly. The 2015-2019 standard, as you probably know, is now extended through December 2021. The standards revision process is underway. Um, there, are, there are technical committees that work on the different elements of it. They go out for public comment. They come back and absorb it. My understanding, and this may change with the virus, is that the next round of standards for comment will be coming out in May. I encourage you to get involved in that process. The, the rules are made up by those who show up in this case. and so. If you, if you can devote a little bit of time to <clears throat> reviewing these standards, it's time well spent. But my understanding is it'll be a common period over the summer, and then there would probably be a rolling out at the fall SAF meeting. And then the, the revised standards will be launched January 2022 is the target. You'll have one year to come into compliance, you know, to transition to the revised standards. Um, and then throughout this entire process, they'll be publicly available through SFI's website. My understanding, of SFI is that like the FSC, they're not, they want to update the standards, but they don't want to do wholesale changes. Um, the, there's this, I think by 
having this, the FSC and SFI, um, it's a big effort to change your standards and update them. And doing it every five years, I think they're going to find is actually quite a challenge to gear up to do it, to get it done. And so I'll be curious after all this to see if they, if they want to stay with a five-year cycle or move to maybe even a 10-year cycle. On the Forest Stewardship Council side, like I said, I was under contract to them for parts of uh, their Principle 6 and Principle 9, the, the environmental side of things. So I know a little more about what's going on there. Auditing practices, of course, are evolving. So they're in a 2018-2020 revision process, and the goal would be that um, they would have a draft for public consultation this year. I do encourage you to get involved with that. But what they're trying to do is at the international level, so the FSC US is trying to update its standards. Canada has already done it. They have to come in compliance with the new principles and criteria and then what are called international generic indicators. And those, that was a long, hard fought process to come up with the IGIs and the new FSC principles and criteria. And, and in some cases that was moving very far towards the left for lack of a better term on social indicators that sort of came back to the middle. But what the FSC US now has to do is without wanting to change their standards dramatically, look at some of these indicators that do have some substantial changes in um, how do they come into compliance with them or indicate why it's not appropriate. So they're the, the working group, and that's how they did it as a small working group um, that's been wrestling with that. And then fairly soon we should see what they've come up with with draft standards. The FSC US's priority issues were regionalism. There used to be regional standards. The Northeast was one and I was on that committee this is part of what I help them with is wrestling with, do we keep the regions? Do we get rid of them all together? Do we change the regional boundaries? And that's gonna be a challenge because it's hard right now in some regions, there's a limit on clear cut size. But in the Northeast, we didn't wanna do that. We wanna leave that up to the foresters. So you've got this one FSC certificate, but if you're on one side of the border, you have to limit clear cut sizes in certain areas. On the other side, you don't. So they're, they're wrestling with that. One of the things you're gonna see, conservation lands and high conservation values are going to receive more attention. There's going to be a need to do more work in that area to identify these things. Customary and traditional rights really are Native American First Nation issues. Family forest indicators are how to certify small forests. Um, climate change will probably be a part of SFI, it definitely will be a part of FSC. They're not gonna duplicate these carbon certification schemes, but you will see more attention paid to climate and carbon sequestration and standards. They're also working on a supplement for certifying forest service lands, which has always been a challenge. So watch for that. So again, what, the, what they envision if all goes well is that in 2021, they have to submit their standard to the FSC International for approval. And there's always a length of time after that uh, so I would expect to see a new standard in the FSC US probably in 2021 and maybe implemented in 2022. So auditing in the time of COVID, um, what's happening, it's, it's rapidly triggering the sea change in how audits are done. And some of these changes may become permanent. As you might imagine, these are they're remote audits now. And I know that it's a lot of money to get an auditing team out on the field, boots on the ground, walking around. And sometimes when, you, when you've audited a landowner for 10, 20 years, you feel like you've seen every tree and you, you can't help but wonder, well, plus things don't change. And so do we really need to do this every year? Why can't we do risk-based auditing and maybe every five years you've got in the field? So this scale intensity and risk is going to be in the new standards for the FSC, probably the SFI, but I think what they're doing now and the, the audit, the certification bodies like scientific certification systems or KPMG are, they're tasked with coming up under the SFI and FSC with how are you gonna do these remote audits? And what may come out of that is to say, you know, these are actually pretty efficient. Why don't we continue with them even once the virus is under control? So really the certification bodies are wrestling with this under with guidance from SFI and FSC um, but they're, they're very much in the middle of trying to figure this out. And probably some of you right now, are, if you were audited this year, are probably wrestling with how this audit going to be conducted. Initial audits under the FSC still require a field visit, but that might change. And recertification audits under the FSC every five years still require field visits. But again, that might change depending on the virus and 
What they might do is extend certificates. If your five-year renewal is up this year, they might say, we're going to extend it by a year because we can't do the field visit. Um, what's happening with these remote audits is more of the, the staff at the certification body, they're conducting the audit. So there's less of a role for contract auditors, the people that you might be used to seeing on audits. So now quickly at the end, um, what do I think is the next 25 years? And you know, in a way, a bit of a joke here, LIDAR, LIDAR, and more LIDARs. I think it's just remote sensing is going to drive auditing a lot, um, particularly as we do these remote audits. Um, on the left here, I think if you're seeing it is an image from New Hampshire where you've got an air photo, which we can all interpret as we normally have. But then you look at LIDAR and you see skid roads and you, you see streams that are mapped in fine scale. And on the other side, we, you know, we see LIDAR from above where we can see the canopy and the tree, then LIDAR, ground LIDAR, where we can actually see the forest. I think remote sensing tools are going to dictate a lot of what gets audited in the future. <clears throat> and so what does that mean, um, particularly for forest engineering side of things, which <clears throat> I know that's a really broad topic, but when I think of that, I think of roads and harvesting and that kind of thing. But I, I think road layout, road construction and road condition is going to receive a lot more attention because you can only drive so far when you're out in the field. But when you have LIDAR, air photos, other remote sensing information, you can see the whole forest, including washouts. So I think you're gonna see more attention to road condition, the number of roads. With that, with certification, the updates, we're seeing more attention being given to what's called intact forest landscapes, uh, roadless areas or roads that are, that are um, put to bed and only used during um, forestry operations. So I think with GIS tools and LIDAR, you're going to be asked a lot of questions about why is that road there and not there? Could you put this road to bed? Remapping streams, wetlands, and vernal pools, often at a finer scale, that's underway right now. And, and with it will come challenges, particularly in Northern Maine, where there's a lot of very small streams that are everywhere. And so what does that mean for operations? Does that mean we have to go around them or, or not? But you're going to have more fine scale information. And what that means in some cases is, is a greater harvest operation efficiency, the kind of the harvesting without placing flags because the operator might have a heads up display that shows, oh, there's a stream, there's a vernal pool. And so they're not looking for a flag, they're looking on their screen. So that, I think that will change. Um, LIDAR based forest inventories will be more precise. So that means you'll probably be asked more precise questions. And there'll probably be a period of time where they ask too many questions about things, um, but then it'll, it'll balance out. But I, I think auditors are going to wrestle with this wealth of data that we've never had before. And, and part of that's the more detailed understanding of forest structure, composition, which is timber volumes, but also ecological attributes like large legacy trees. There's also, I think, with what I've seen with some companies is these productivity data sets that are based on real-time harvesting information. The, the FSC International is placing a lot more emphasis on labor issues, wage rates, how long they work. And, and I can just see coming down the road, there's particularly remote audits, there's this access to how much time a person's spending in a machine and um, that kind of thing. So I, I would be thinking a little bit about how that might be used, which is another reason, again, to, to weigh in on the standards as they're developed. But I think most importantly, in a reflection of the meeting, as we realize there's this changing of the guard, there's a next generation of forest managers and auditors and even researchers who they see the forest in a completely different way than we have over the last 25 years. And I think that's definitely going to affect how audits are conducted and, and what the audit topics are and, and what you're being held to during an audit. And that is two days and 25 minutes. Um, thank you for your, your time and your attention and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I know that's a, a lot of information, a lot of topics covered with a one fell swoop. Okay, thanks, Tom. I'm like, I'm sorry, Mike, thanks for doing this. And I was just reading some other stuff while you were saying that. Does anybody have any questions for Mike? He covered quite a bit of information in this 25 minutes. Must be somebody with a question. If you wanna share a question, down at the bottom of your screen is the chat button. You can just click on that. <clears throat> Let's 
So Martin said he'd like you to say more about the last point, differences in perspective. The, um, <clears throat> the last point uh, about just where I think auditing is heading, you mean? I'm not sure. I mean, his question is, say more about your last point, differences in perspective. Oh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> um, well, not to get personal, but my son, um, Neil Thompson, is on the forestry faculty at the University of Maine at Fort Kent. And one of his areas of expertise is LIDAR and GIS and all that. And, and I try my best to keep up. But um, when we talk or we walk in the woods, I know that he sees the forest in a very different way than I do. You know, I'm of an age where you know, you started out with a compass and, and maybe ortho photos from USGS, and then you'd have your nine by nine photos, and you could only see a certain amount. And then we went through the era, and Louis, of course, is an expert in this, is aerial photography got better, and GIS came along so we could organize that information a little better. But, but now with LIDAR and other remote sensing tools, um, we're down to seeing individual trees and canopy and the condition of the tree. It's you know, early disease outbreaks. Um, the structure, I think, from an ecological standpoint, um, is just much more precise. We're able to see downwoody debris in some cases, particularly after a cut. If you do a, an even age cut, we can see down to the individual tree that's there. And, um, and then the stream mapping is much more precise than what we used to be able to do from air photo interpretation or even a, a GPS point. And so with that, I think it's an overwhelming amount of information compared to what we used to have. And my, my curiosity with this generation is what are they gonna do with that information? And I look at the current researchers, and again, I'll use my son as an example, is that the questions that they're able to ask and even con conceive of are I think quite novel. It's because of they they they're essentially visualizing their way through the the forest all the way from the canopy down to the ground level and back up again. They can zoom in, they can zoom out, they can capture how much volume is there. They can look at species composition as opposed to the you know what some of us older folks are used to is being out there with compass and chain and diameter tapes and that kind of thing. And so I, I think that. Um, will lend itself to changes in how certification audits are conducted and what you're being asked. Um, because the standards themselves are fairly general when it comes right down to it in terms of silviculture and ecological issues. But I think with all this wealth of information, there will come probably a host of new questions from this younger cohort of, of managers, researchers, and auditors. So, Mike, uh, Dan Phillips asked, has LIDAR proven to be accurate compared to actual harvest volumes? You kind of implied this in your last answer. Well, and, and probably, Lou, I defer to you, but my, my understanding from the companies that are using it, and they're, they're certainly, you have to be very careful with LIDAR, um, but my understanding is most companies are saying, we won't do ground inventories anymore, that those days are over, that the... Um, what I understand is that the, you know, one thing if you're doing photo interpretation and doing things like that is uh, you can get tired at the end of the day. Maybe that, maybe your inventory at four o'clock is different than at eight o'clock. And with LIDAR and those tools, what they say is they never get tired. They're, they're much more precise and they're getting better at uh, characterizing the, um, the tree itself and its condition, its value, um, density, that kind of thing. And, um, so yeah, I think it has proven itself. I think some companies are already pretty far down the road uh, with using that to replace traditional inventories. Maybe the traditional inventory is just a spot check on the LIDAR itself. Uh, and then there's a, a lot of other companies that haven't, haven't started doing it. So we're, we're definitely in this transition period that'll probably take five or 10 years before everybody switches over. And I go back to, you know, part of what I like to study is the history of forest management. And, and I remember the history of when topographic maps first came out and uh, some of the, the foresters back in the day insisted you have to have a topographic map to manage a forest. And others said, oh, no, you don't. You know, that's, that's extra work and money. We don't need to do that. And then the aerial photos came along. And I think that 
LIDAR and related products are just that one more tool that I can just see that they're already adopted by a lot of, well, certainly researchers and managers. And then nonprofits uh, and then people in the carbon world are definitely taking advantage of LIDAR tools for estimating carbon sequestration. So I just, looking ahead, particularly for the next 25 years, I think it's a way of life. And it, and it has and will change how we see the forest, how we manage it, and then ultimately how we audit conformance to, to certification standards. Thanks. Are there any other questions anybody may have? Well, if there aren't, then I want to thank everybody for joining us. Mike, you did a great job summarizing a two-day workshop into a short period of time. And as you alluded, eventually we'll have this all up online so that folks can return to this and review it again and reach out to any of us if you have questions. I think we have some more sessions coming. I'm, I'm not uh, sure of the dates yet, but please be alert that they will be coming out and um, hope everybody's doing well, trying to get through these times. And even on a rainy day like today, we had a good session. So thank you again and stay safe. All right, thank you all.